Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Very happy to have you. Uh, bef- I- I- we're going to go to the writer's strike, uh, the actor's strike. I have a question, but before, did you know that in 98, you were in Arrival 2? Yep. Which had nothing to do with The Arrival, but then you were also in 2016 in the movie The, the Arrival. Arrival. Yeah. Fucking random shit that the universe <laughs> gives you, right? Isn't that? Yeah. Did you think about it at the time? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, or, The Arrival had nothing to do with The Arrival nothing. 2. Arrival That's why 2 it's was, even more random. It was technically a sequel. To, right, to yeah. the original one with Charlie Sheen. Yeah, it, it, right. it was Arrival, The Arrival 2. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. and then uh, it was with uh, Patrick Muldoon uh, back then. Yeah, it was a fun time. Uh, you know, movie was okay, but you know. Most of those at yeah. the time. I mean, I, you know, I've done some really good movies that I'm proud of, and I've done some other ones that, you know, were, you know, crap. But it's like, you know, you, you always, you, acting is fun. Even when it's not going doing well or not, you know, I don't care. It's fun. You're working, right? So, like, I did a movie that was uh, so-so, it, but it was for the Sci-Fi Channel, and uh, we shot it in Brazil with my wife and uh, Stephen Baldwin. And so people say, "Why did you do that movie?" It's because I spent a month and a half in Brazil and got paid for it. Yeah, I had you fun. Know. This is my life. It's like Michael Caine. Dude, why did you do Jaws four? He said because it paid for my house in the Bahamas. That's a yeah. good answer. So there, bingo. You know. You've accomplished something that every actor that I've spoken to uh, kind of strives for, but they don't always get is longevity in acting. Yeah. It's it go. Well, that's I, another I'm, way of saying you're old. No, 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 no. It is so. Go look at people's IMDb. The mm-hmm. hardest thing is you see, especially now, it's kind of like it seems long. If in five years, within a five year span, they've been doing movies. Right. Not going to the nineties and just it's very hard. And you so you've already achieved that, which is insane. Right. It's, it's amazing. Uh, do you does it ever? Does it ever pop in your head? You're like, God damn, I, when did I start? What am I doing? How the hell have I been able to do this for um, this long? You've been I, in so much I, stuff that we've seen you. I've been lucky. Yeah. I mean, really, it's it's what it boils down to. I don't need these headsets. No, nah, you're about. not a guy who needs them. Um, yeah, so being, I mean, I, I kind of fell into it uh, back in the beginning. I'd done some, like a little bit of extra work, and, and if people want to become actors, I suggest you do a bit of extra work so you can get onto a set and find out what, what a set is like. And but don't just sit there and read a book. Watch the actors, how they prepare. Watch the director, the director and how he does his directions and stuff. Uh, blocking and, and all the other stuff and finding your mark and everything else. You can learn a lot, but I wouldn't do a lot of extra work if you want to be an actor because you don't get pegged as an extra. It's, it's two separate things. Yeah, right? once you get pegged as an extra, it's kind of hard to get yeah, out of that. Yeah, you know? so, uh, I, but I, again, uh, was with my wife, well, not my wife at the time, my girlfriend at the time, and uh, Jane Heitmeyer, and she got a part on this TV series called Sirens, which was a cop show that was shot back here in uh, 1994 with uh, Robin Spry and Tellefsen. And um, I was talking to her agent, and her agent said, what do you say? Do you want to be an extra on it? I went, nah, no, I'll pass on that. She goes, uh, oh, you want to you want to try out for a role? And I went, yeah, I, that'd be fun. Oh, look at that. Right? What an upgrade. I said, okay. Uh, she, I said, what do you do? She goes, let me let me work it up, and uh, we'll see what we can do. I said, okay. And then that night, she goes, okay, you're going in for this part. Uh, well, I'll fax you over. <laughs> you're dating yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll fax you over the lines, the sides. Uh, and so get a photo headshot resume and uh, go on in tomorrow. And I went, great. I said, oh, what's a headshot? You know, so yeah. anyway, a picture of yourself, right? So I got the headshot, I went in, and they'd actually, the, the part I was uh, was going in for, they'd already cast, but they cast me for another one. So my very first audition, I got a role. And That's, that was cool. Who does that? Yeah, so, um, and it was uh, it was cool, because um, my, my girlfriend at the time has this big love scene with her husband, and then he comes downstairs, and he gets shot and killed, and for you know, two episodes, she's going around trying to find out who killed her husband and why. And uh, yeah, I killed her husband. Oh, so, there we go. Yeah, wow. That's romantic. Yeah. And they, they, they didn't know that at the time, but they kind of liked it. So I said, well, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, squirrel with my girlfriend, you go down. <laughs> uh, so that was like June the 5th, 1994. And I sat on set and I just, I said to myself, this is fun. Uh, this is really You got really the bug, you got cool. the itch. It's, you know, yeah. So I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, make, give it a shot. And at that time, like I, I DJed for many years, uh, in clubs and stuff like that. Uh, got Guido was telling world. me that you DJed. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did that from the time I was 16. So being, you know, how did you get into that? Uh, I started in high school, uh, but that was back in the day when, you know, mobile DJs didn't exist. We just kind of 
invented things as we went along. Oh, we're talking tur- we're talking about real DJ turntables. Oh, yeah, I'm not yeah, talking vinyl, about clicking play on oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 vinyl. Yeah. And uh, you know, I mean, you had to have an engineering degree to try to make a record go backwards. You know, now you press a button. Um, but yeah, so I started working with, back in the disco days, and this city you can't compare what this city was like now to what it was back then. It used to be a real city. Oh yeah. It was just, it was the second most important city for, for dance and disco. The clubs were everywhere. I mean, you would go to Montreal, you, you know, you could hit 20 clubs in the space of an hour. If and you good just, ones. I'm, yeah. Every one was a good one. I mean, so I started at the Alta Tech 727 when I was 16 uh, they never asked how old I was. I was run by the Queenie Hotel at the time. That was on top of Place de Marie. And I had my 18th birthday there. And he said, how old are you? I said, 18. He says, you worked here for two years. I said, yeah. Don't ask questions, You Steve. never asked. <laughs> then uh, during the Olympics, it was a Harlequin in the Four Seasons. Uh, and everybody who was anybody who was here for the Olympics uh, came to the Harlequin. And uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, it, was, it was just a trip. I mean, uh, clubs were open seven days a week, and they worked. And, you know, there was like, you know, I mean, okay, I'll give you an example. If you're on, uh, on a mountain street, you know, you walk up to the Maison uh, back in the day, depending on, you know, what year it was, it was, you know, the, it was the Playboy Club, it was Valerie's, it was September's, which I worked at for six years in the eighties. Uh, Harlow's was next door downstairs. You go down the street, you got Bogarts and you go to the John Bull pub. You keep going to Don Juan's, you'd hang a right, you'd go to the tube on the left side was Dominic's. And these are all in like 76, 77, 79, huge clubs everywhere. You had like pretty well, the two most important clubs aside from Studio 54 we're in, in this New city. York were in this city, which was uh, Limelight and uh, 1234. 1234 yeah. was big even since then. Oh, God, yeah. It opened up August, I think about August, the 5th or 7th, I believe. It was a Tuesday, uh, 1978. Oh, you got a great memory. Yeah. So well, I, was, I, was first, I was the first customer in there, me and my light man and the two girls. And we just went and it was an open bar. I said, okay, see you later. Go dance and stay at the bar. But yeah, it was a hell of a club. Um, I worked at Studio 55 back then, which was another great location. And then uh, there was Don Juan's, Yesterday's, uh, September's, like I said, that, but that goes more into the 80s. So I went into the 80s, but I also worked in New York. I worked in Chicago. I did uh, Miami, Acapulco, Cancun, um, so Puerto Vallarta. In your head, it was all, you thought, DJ, that's my I was, thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wish, you know, I was DJing today because they're making a hell of a lot more money than we made, but I was, we were okay. You know, I mean, I, I worked at Har- one place in New York, which was a competition to Studio 54. Uh, and, you know, because what happened was club owners on the Eastern seaboard would come up to Montreal to buy their sound and lighting because the best sound and lighting companies were here in Montreal because of the European aspect and then the lighting that came over from Europe and everything. So you had Disco Spec and Lumibec and these these companies. So they would go and then the owner, what they would do is they would go to like the owner of Studio 55 and say, okay, we're going to put your lights in for free. And then they would use it as a showroom. So they would bring club owners up from all across, like, you know, from Atlanta, from Florida, uh, New York, they would come up and they'd see the, uh, the, the lights in action. But and the owners would come up and I get getting get job offers, right? And yeah, they'd see the lights and the DJ. Yeah, action, you yeah. know, so uh, <laughs> so one guy came up and he says, uh, why don't you start working my place in New York? And I was a cocky, you know, 21 year old at the time. I said, yeah, yeah you can't afford me. <laughs> he says, yeah, what do you want? And I said, all right, well, I said, New York, I'm going to have to have an apartment. I'm going to have to have a car. Uh, I'm going to have to have airfare back and forth because I got to see, you know, my family. Uh, my light man comes with me and uh, I don't know, a dollar a head per person that comes through the door. He says, you start Thursday. Oh, he called your bluff. <laughs> okay. So it's like, all right. And, it was it was the competition to Studio Fifty Four at the time because it was, it was Fifty Four and there was also a place that I had no idea about the size and everything else called Xenons. How big was that? Uh, they get about two thousand people on a Thursday. They would probably get thirty five hundred on a Friday and five thousand on a Saturday. It was huge, right? And I'm making a dollar a head here, cash. Oh, no. the good old days. Okay, and do you, do you think I'm thinking of you know? stock market, you know, <laughs> you know, bonds and stuff. No, we, we would, uh, <laughs> we would leave Friday night. We go to the stage delicatessen for, for breakfast. Uh, then we, we'd wait up. Then we, we go to LaGuardia or, or Kennedy, get on the first flight available. We'd fly down to Miami or Fort Lauderdale. We'd be on the beach in like three or four hours, stay on the beach and then fly back to New York and then go to work. 
That's what, what we used to do. Fun life though yeah. at that time. That, well, You're young was, too. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, it was, oh. Yeah, but you know, in retrospect, oh shit. Should have saved some of that money. Put it into Microsoft. You know what I'm saying? But, if you, you knew, know, who knew? Uh, but the yeah, but I mean, I, I did parties for the Jacksons, uh, Phil Collins at Genesis. Uh, yeah, it was it was just it was a great time. And one day I will write a movie script. I was about to say either a movie script or a book. It, something it's has gonna to be a come. movie script, and it's going to be just about all the, the adventures. And we'll call it "They Only Come Out at Night." They Only Come Out at Night is a good yeah. title. Yeah, and then uh, so yeah, so I mean, I never thought about acting at all, right? And then um, I did, like I said, I did a little extra work back in a another terrible movie. It was called "Dirty Tricks" with Kate Jackson and Elliot Gould back in 1979, and that just gave me an indication of what it was like. And I didn't really think anything of it. Went into the 80s, uh, you know, clubs again. Uh, met my future wife uh, in 88. I, mean, I was on radio at the time now. I'd started, I'd gotten into radio in 86. How'd you get into that? Again, fell into it. Um, the, the, I, I got to do a radio show because of the, the mixing. And uh, well, the you have a voice for radio, you can well, do it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, it came along. I mean, I listen to myself sometimes. I actually have some recordings back in from 1979 of me, like I was doing a live show on it's called CLFM, which is 98.5 now. Uh, and listening to myself, and I, I just cringe. It's always you know? like that when you listen to yourself. Um, but then, yeah, but then I did, I, I did mix 96, uh, I did that in 88 for a couple of years and didn't really pay enough money, so. Uh, Mario Trombley took that over, uh, and if I'd known it was going to go 30 years or whatever, and he would have made millions of dollars on all the CDs he did and everything, I'm, hmm, anyway, but nah, he's, he was a good guy. I like Whatever that. happened to MC Mario? He's still around. Yeah, we just did a disco party uh, back in April down at uh, the old uh, the old Hyatt, and we got about six 700 people all dressed up in disco stuff. And, God damn, uh, I yeah. wish I, because yeah. I remember it was such a voice of my childhood. Yep. MC Mario. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember that oh, yeah. so vividly. Yeah. And I was too young, so I never got to see what he looks like. Yeah. I never got to meet him. Oh, well, I'll, have yeah. to get, I'll have to get him here for you. I'll get, I'd love to talk to him. Yeah, yeah. we could do that. Yeah. I can get Mario here. I'll give him a call. Nice guy, huh? Uh, he's a great guy. Okay. Yeah. Very so, cool. Uh, and then, you know, I did, uh, then I started a radio show on uh, CFQR in uh, 2001. And that lasted, uh, that lasted 10 years. So did that for a while. And radio was great, but this. But the problem with radio is, it, uh, I got into it. Uh, you know, I was probably one of the last guys who had a show where I programmed my own music, and I could say whatever I wanted to say, do whatever I wanted to do, have whatever, whoever. Yeah, you because know, that's unheard of now. Oh, now, you know, now it's like music, 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 and they they cut you off down to ten seconds, five seconds, or whatever. Um, they don't even get professionals anymore. <laughs> well, they don't need them. It's all you know, machines, and. Uh, the thing was, is it wasn't fun anymore, you know? So, and I, and I you know, I learned one thing. I, I, always, I will never do something that I don't like because I don't want it to be a job, yeah. right? So, um, you know, it's the acting again. 94, I was still acting. And still the, I, I stopped working as a DJ in clubs, started running clubs uh back in the early night i think the last club i worked at full-time was probably la mac trois on vo street in oh. uh the east end okay and that was probably 1990 then uh i opened up the ozone which was the old september's uh, that was for about a year then i worked at uh, was running a uh, neville's with neville back on mountain street another great place to go on tuesday nights uh, club extreme oh. until 94 then i went out to the west island and that's where it was back in 97 and I was actually working, acting and working the clubs at the same time. And I got actually funnily enough, the arrival two. All right. And, uh, so I was working at the club till three and, you know, being called 5 at 5 AM. Right. So it just killed me. So I made the big decision that, okay, I'm going to stop the clubs and I become an actor. And that's what I did. I became a working actor. Which after, the arrival which, too. Which that, after the arrival too, I didn't work for six months. I was was like, of all I movies that motivate you, it's the you arrival know. too. Uh, yeah, just because I like sleep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but you know, I mean, I've been very lucky. Uh, I was, I came up at a time in this city where there was actually a lot of work. There was tons of shows being done. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get some roles in some really, really popular series like Student Bodies. Uh, I remember Student Bodies. Cody's dad. 
um, back to Sherwood where I played the sheriff of Nottingham and just shamelessly ripped off Alan Rickman any way I could. Um, so, it, it, you know, if somebody says, what's acting? It's like being a kid again and playing with better toys because, you know, the guns really work and you, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're jumping over cars and, and, well, you don't really do it. Your stunt guy does it, but, you know, it makes you look good, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's working with, with people. I mean, uh, even now, I mean, I've been in it for, you know, 30 years. And you still get a, you know, I mean, I, I got a part where I was working on a movie with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, right? And it's just me and her and doing this scene. And we were shooting it the whole day. But I used to have a big crush on her when I was Oh, young. so did I. I'm right, just I, letting I, you know. I'm throwing Mr. that Scarface. out there. Come yeah. on, okay? Amazing person to work with. She you know? seems nice. Okay, she so she's genuine. Okay, yeah, good, good. She was really, really nice. And I'm amazing to, to, to work with again. And it's like... Uh, uh, Jason Sudeik uh, is another great actor I worked with on a play thing called The Race. And again, here's a guy, and just, yeah, he's a, such a great actor. You, and you, 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 you know, you're, you will always learn, always, continually. You can never learn enough when it comes to acting. And it's just the stuff I learned from this guy was just great. And he's doing uh, Ted Lasso now, he did. Um, who else? What is uh, it? I've always wanted Sudeikis. What is that? I don't know, actually. That's a good point. I don't know what nationality it is, but but a great guy. Seems you know, cool. And I mean, I, I have been lucky that there's been a few people that have been, you know, eh. iffy, but mostly yeah, but good. mostly uh, mostly the they've been they've been really really fun to work with. Um, I did a movie last year, which is coming out this year, called uh, Longing, which is with Richard Gere. Oh shit! And uh, and again, just. It wasn't work. It was, you know, and the, the scenes where we were, we had a lot of scenes in the cemetery, this cemetery that takes place because apparently the movie is that uh, his daughter, yeah, sorry, my daughter, it, she killed herself. His son died in an accident, but he didn't realize he had a son. So he basically comes to town to look, find out what his son was like. And we meet in the cemetery and we strike up a conversation and then we have long conversations about our kids and stuff. So it's like a good movie and also... It's, yeah, it's... yeah. It's, to work it's with Richard Gere. It's just, yeah, I mean, it just, again, it was... It's just, uh, you know, you, you look up at the sky and you go, thank you, this, this, is, this is really cool. Yeah, you uh, got not just the longevity, but you get these moments. I've been lucky, again, you know, I mean... Uh, you know, Dolph Lundgren, I've done about three or four movies with. He was a lot of fun, the action guy. He was Best a lot bad of fun. Guy. And uh, so... Who else was, uh, I, you know, Sean Young. She was uh, interesting. Uh, that's, I'll leave it at that. I was going to say, yeah, is that? <laughs> um, oh, he's Lithuanian German, Sudeikis. All right, now we, we there know. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Poseidon. Uh, hey, see? That. That's, why he big, that's why he gets paid the big that's bucks. That's why he right? gets the big bucks, this guy. <laughs> the, so uh, I don't want to forget. So yep. writer's strike is over. Yeah, actor strike right now. Still on. It's still on, yeah. and the thing I didn't get, and that's why, I, and people ask me, but I don't know, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you. Who knows? The fight right now is it mostly for rights on because AI is trying to come in. Right. So we're trying to make sure that the actors keep their rights, and you can't just steal their likeness. Well, yeah. And recreate them. That's one of the things, okay. right? Well, the first thing that happened was the the, the sticking point with the writers was that the, again, AI is gonna write scripts, right? Uh, so they're concerned about that because again, it's their livelihood and the deal they came up with is yes. And writers now contractually do not have to write, they have to work on a script. It has to be written by a human. By a human. So acting is two, twofold. One is streaming and residuals. Now residuals is like you get paid to do it, a, a part in a movie. Uh, in Canada and the States, it's a little bit different. In the States, it's you get paid and then you will get residuals, right? If the, how much the movie airs, where does it air? And because streaming came along, it wasn't anything there. So, you know, streamers are making tons of money and the actors are getting minuscule. You amount. can have a hit movie, everyone's watching, they're making millions off it, yeah. and because it wasn't included in the initial concept of Correct. how we're going to distribute these Correct. films, yeah. you'll get zero. Yeah, well, get minimal, minuscule, yeah, okay. right? Uh, so that's one of the, the key things. The other thing is the AI, because they basically want to take your you, and once they have enough of you, 
AI can make you do anything and say anything you want. I've seen what they said, and it's very scary. You don't need actors. No, they said take your likeness and own it in perpetuity, which means they have one good movie of you, and they have all the angles that they need. I don't need Larry Day anymore. No, we can do this. Yeah, so that's the key big aspect is, and and it's it's you know AI is doing to me it's it's dangerous. But I you know Terminator, you know. No, it's for a lot and for work. I just had a podcast about this, and we're talking. It's so. Because there's a lot of stuff that uh, AI is doing that's going to make our lives so much easier. Right. So because of that, we're not thinking of the cons. That this, it's going to change our economy completely. Well, yeah, but you're also forgetting to the point, though, is that, yeah, it, for every good thing for AI, there's a bad, there's a bad thing yep. for AI. Because right now, a perfect example is they're using AI to mimic vo- mimic people's voices. Yep. And they're calling grandmothers, and they sound just like the kids. And it's, you know, it's convincing them even more to, to get ripped off, right? It's the same thing with, with uh, you know, dare I say, China. Yeah, I mean, they don't think in five years or 10 years. They think in decades. And the, what they want to do is they want to be the global superpower. And they, you know, yes, you can have a way to use AI and you can have your rules and you can have everything else. Not everyone's going to play by the rules. Not everyone's going to play by the rules, right? And so what happens, you get... You know, military, you know, military AIs going to run a war, you know? And I think they're already you know, doing that. I had read something you know, about that. There's You're going to have, you know, I mean, like, look how war has changed and all the stuff that's going on with drones and everything else. I mean, it's, uh, I'm glad I'm how old I am. You got to live the real years yeah, where because, everything was uh, Yeah, because analog. I just, going forward, it, it really scares the hell out of me. And, you know, the economy, uh, how it is to buy a house these days. Impossible. Uh, you know, I mean, I feel for the, I feel for the, the generation. It's, it's, you know, the Generation Z, I believe it is. They're, they're the new ones right now. Yeah, the ones right now, yeah. yeah. Um, they're going to have to toughen up. They got screwed. They got yeah, the short they're end the, of that. They're the first generation, actually, which is not going to do as well as the previous generation, which And sucks. through no fault of their own. No. They, yeah, they were thrown into this. Yeah, you know. So yeah, I mean they you know, like they called COVID boomer remover, you know. <laughs> but uh, is uh, wait the negotiations are they looking good? Uh, they're they're still negotiating. I mean, I'm doing a series right now uh, called Back to da- Welcome to Dairy. So exciting! Uh, which is yeah, it's 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 for HBO Max, nine episodes. Uh, it's it's a prequel to the It movies. Uh. So you're gonna find out exactly how. Pennyworth became and what what the entity really is and stuff. So it's it's really cool. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, half of our cast is between ten and fourteen. Now we've shot three episodes. We have another six to go. We stopped shooting in uh, in July, and now we're not. These doing kids going to grow though. That's the problem. Okay, okay. I'm not crazy. <laughs> not going to look the same when we come back, and I don't know what we're going to do with that. Um, and You're going to need you know, AI to. <laughs> to, to, to some, to work some computer work, <laughs> you know. I mean, the same thing they do when they make, uh, you know, like uh, when they make uh, De Niro and Pacino younger. And uh, that looked horrible, movies. though. It that was, yeah, it that looked was, a bit off. I mean, don't off. forget, it's the same thing. If you go back to 1997 and Titanic and the computer-generated stuff that they did then, everybody's like, "Oh my God!" If you look at it today, you're going, mm, "But you know, everything." Is going to get better. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, just the, you know, the effects and, and how we shoot a movie now compared to, well, we don't use film anymore a, a lot. I mean, it's all some digital. directors would still want to use film, but uh, it's just, you know, and, and you get, you get really talented guys in, in coming up and they're, they're shooting a movie on this. I, I've seen you know? little stuff get shot with cameras that I would not expect to be used. Yeah. It's baffling when it comes out. Yes, yeah, nice. there's a couple that come out like, pretty God. good, you know. But I mean, like, you, you got to worry about lighting. You got to worry about sound. You got to worry about, uh, you know, people that are sad. For every minute you see on the screen, let's say for a major motion picture, I would say it's probably about 12 hours worth of work yeah. to get that one minute, So crazy. You know, um, you, know I, I'm, you know, again, I've just been lucky to do what I love to do. Uh, I just finished uh, a series uh, called Plan B, which was uh, a French series, and now they're doing it in English for uh, this is the second season, and uh, had a great time on that. 
So that'll be out in September, probably. And it's, it's if everything a, goes well. Yeah, well, again, if everything goes well, but I, but this is CBC, so it's Canadian. Okay, so, so the, yeah, they don't have to I'm worry. I'm really happy about that. I mean, you know, dairy. I don't know what's going to happen there because everything's on hold. So what shocks me is that it's on hold for so long because if it's unreasonable requests, I get why it would take longer. But to res, to receive residuals from a new platform that they're going to be distributing on doesn't seem unreasonable. It seems no, logical. No, no. But, but again, there's, it's politics. There's a lot of stuff with the producers. They basically think that the actors, you know, okay, don't forget. You've got, you know, your, your A-list, you know, multi-millionaires making hundreds of million dollars on, on movies. Like, you know, God knows what, uh, what the gang made on Barbie, but it's, oh, it's, it's substantial, a lot too, right? Yeah. But most of the actors, probably 98% of them, make under $50,000 a year. Probably a lot more of them make less than twenty five. dollars uh, So, you know, the producers are going to say, well, you know, we'll let them sweat for a couple of months, and then when they start losing their houses, they'll, they'll, we'll own them. I heard that that was a strategy with the writer's strike, too, and I yeah. didn't like that when no. I heard that. And that's exactly what they tried to do. But everybody, I think it's, it is, if they cave in now, it's the death of the industry as far as we know it, as far as the acting community is concerned. So, If the actors cave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, so I, we're not going to cave. I, I think that they're going to finally come to something. And there's different times, right? The writers are back now. So they don't really need the actors right now because the writers have got to write up the shows and they got to do everything uh, as far as the scripts are concerned. Come pilot season, which would be in February when all the new shows are developed and shot and everything else that's going to hurt the producers more so what i think is going to happen is maybe they get something done by next month but by january they they'll they'll come up with something i just hope that the the, the union uh comes up with the the best that they can get from the producers and don't don't settle for you know too much of a compromise. Do you find it hard to uh, land roles cross border? Is it easier on one side of the border than the other? Um, it's it's nowadays it's a lot easier because you know don't forget back in the the old days you used to go to the casting directors' offices, you used to go and do the auditions live. Now you do the audition self tapes, which I think it was was because of COVID. But yeah. now even though COVID's over, <laughs> we'll see. Um, you you you're still doing self-tapes, which I prefer to do. Because, I was going to ask, do you prefer? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, much, I much prefer to do self-tapes okay. because then, you know, uh, you don't have to. I mean, I remember driving from here when I was living in Montreal to Toronto, going into an audition for five minutes and driving back. You know, so, yeah, that's... Especially if you don't land the gig. Oh, yeah, well, you know, well, you know that's the other thing. I mean, you know, I, I when I've talked to other actors who are up and coming, they say, you know, uh, first of all, what's it like? You explain that to them, but, you know, Learning to audition and learning to act are two different things because when you're acting and you've got the role, the pressure's off and then you've got everything working with you. You've got hair, you got makeup, you got your costume, you've got your props, you've got everything to make the character come to life. Auditioning, you're sitting in a, in a room, uh, in a chair and you, you know, for the first one, you'll have maybe two people there. And then, you know, if you get to the callbacks and everything else, you know, you may have five to 10. You've, I've been to a callback, there were 20 people sitting in the room. Um, so it's so much better just to, because you can set up your lighting the way you like it. You can take your time and then you can put your best work forward and then you send it off. But, you know, I, I equate acting, if you want a, a comparison to baseball. So... In baseball, if you hit three hits out of 10 times at bat, you're a superstar, yeah. right? Acting, if you're getting one audition in 20, you're doing really, really good. So, you know, 19 out of 20 times, it's rejection. Mm. And you can't take it personal because it's there, there are so many reasons. First of all, there's a heck of a lot of talented people out there. Second of all, you have to believe in yourself, but you, you can't get depressed about it. it it's, you have to have a really thick skin. Uh, there's a lot of rejection in it. Uh, yeah, you gotta love what you're doing. Uh, and uh, if it, you know, I've been lucky enough that I, I've made a living out of it, which is very hard to do, but I don't wanna be famous. And I, I, I just like being work, you know, I, because I've, I've seen what happens with the famous. I mean, when I was in, uh, 
with uh Oh, here we go. I'm gonna have a senior moment here. Oh, God, she's gonna kill me. But I don't remember her name. Uh, I remember uh, hanging out with these kids. Hang on, it's gonna come. I, I shot. It's a movie on the road. We shot in Argentina. Kristen Stewart. Oh shit! So we're. In, I got a story about Kristen Stewart. Okay, well, go ahead with yours. <laughs> no, I was. I, I had seen her. This is the girl from Twilight, right? Yeah. Dude, I had seen her at. Um, I was the Hollywood Film Awards in 2013 on the red carpet. Yep. Yeah. She rolled her eyes at me, by the way. I said hi, and she rolled her eyes. I didn't like that, but I understood why. <laughs> I had never... I didn't realize how mean the paparazzi was. Oh, they're... they're this is horrific. They were yelling stuff at her, like, no, don't be a bitch. Look over here. Oh, and yeah, I was like, there's camera. Okay, You're so, being... Real. How come nobody cares that they're yelling at this girl? And her, you, it's like she was used to it. She was like, all right. Oh, yeah, but yeah. here, I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, uh, so we fly into uh, Buenos Aires, and... Uh, we're at the airport. We had to transfer airports because we're flying to a place called Angostura, which is another 1,300 kilometers away, uh, near the border, way down south on the border with Chile. And uh, so she wanted to go out for a cigarette. And I said, oh, we'll go out for a smoke. So I'll go out. And uh, the, the uh, AD comes up. No, you can't do that. You know? She goes, well, why not? Why can't I go? You know why. No. She just, she wants to have... A normal life, be able to do what she wants to do. But then we go out and there's this girl there. Oh, can I take a picture? Can I take a picture? She goes, yeah, okay, so yeah. And Chris goes, oh, everybody in, right? So we all get into that. That picture was out on the internet five minutes after we had taken it. Oh, yeah, of course. So now we fly by plane to Angostura. We get there and we get driven to our hotel. And we get into the hotel. And she was shooting. And we went out with a couple of the other... Uh, cast members, and we found this really, really great steakhouse. There's really good restaurants, and they, they're great for wine and they're great for beef. So, oh, Argentina? Well, yeah, yeah, steaks, yeah. man. So, yeah. uh, I said the next day to Chris, and I said, uh, "Yeah, we found this really cool steak place." He goes, "You wanna, you wanna go up for dinner?" Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. But by the time this is 24 hours, okay, they had found out where she was staying. They had driven. 1,300 kilometers, they had, and there was about 1,000 of them who had surrounded the hotel to the point where she couldn't get out of the hotel. I don't want that. What a life. Okay, I like going to the store. Somebody goes, oh, you look familiar. Do we go to high school together? Oh, maybe, you know. Um, I did once, um, I shot, the, I did this movie called um, Human Trafficking with Amir Servino, Donald Sutherland. He does that in real life. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we had to go to, we had to, uh, I went to Bangkok actually to shoot that for, and it was a lot of fun. How so cool was that? That was very cool. Yeah. I love, I didn't like Bangkok that much, but I loved, we went, I went afterwards to uh, Koh Samui uh, and Phuket and it was, it's paradise down there. Yeah. So. It's those um, blue, it's that blue water. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I mean, Bangkok, because we were shooting, it was all about human trafficking and everything else, right? So we actually shot in the red light district in some of the parts. And we we actually shot in one of the bordellos. And I was talking to the one of the women there and just what, it's it's just, uh, it's scary what uh, what happens. So the movie came out, it had a great message, but I played a part in my, my end. My agent Susan Glenn uh, called up and she said, well, they want you for this role. I go, okay. She goes, but yeah, you're playing a pedophile. And I went, oh, I don't think I'll do that. You know, she goes, well, no, it's, all, not, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's just inferred, right? You're a well-respected doctor. I said, nah, but look, I'm on, I'm on a kid's show. And I just, you know, I, I'm going to pass. She goes, well, you have to go to, you have to go to Thailand to shoot it. Oh, I could do that. Right, so now we go. If I get the it. opportunity to be okay. a pedophile in real life, I will play one. <laughs> so, but I come back. The movie airs. And it's it's really good. The message to the movie is is excellent. Um, but I'm in IGA, <laughs> and I'm at the cash. And there's a person in front of me. There's five people behind me, and I just got my stuff. And I'm just, and then the, the cashier is there, and she's like, boop, 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 boop. She goes, T'étais dans le, le film uh, Trafic Humain, hein? <laughs> and I went, Yeah. And she goes, The doctor, huh? 
Oh, I went, that's yeah. what you get recognized for. Avec le petit gars, hein? Yeah, yeah. He said, he said, oh, he said, I'm going like, movie, movie. Yeah, it's a movie, guys. <laughs> it's not really it's me. Like, not real. Right. But uh, I'm oh, glad you yeah. questioned it because I had my old, my previous agent, when I started getting a bit bigger in comedy in French, right. she's like, uh, here, I got a role for you. There's a, co- what's the cop show called here? 30... Uh, 30 19 uh, uh, Okay. So she goes, it's a, she goes, I just want you to know, you're going to play a pedophile and you have these juvenile, like 15-year-old hookers. And I was like, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. She's like, why not? I go, because it's going to be the first time that like Monsieur Madame Tout Le Monde sees me in Quebec. Yeah. yeah. I want him to come to my comedy shows. <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to... And she couldn't understand why. Yeah. And then she got back to me. She's like, I got another role for you. Full frontal nudity? No. Nope. I'm like, what are you that. talking about? Yeah. This is the first time they're going to see me on screen. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah it's not my agent. No, I won't do. I, no, <laughs> no. Because no. if I take my clothes off, everybody's going to see this. Everyone's leaving. Yeah, everybody's, yeah, put your clothes back on. That's okay. But I uh, love that you question. You're like, nah. nah no, you have to because you, you, as an actor, you draw lines on what you're comfortable with doing and what you're not comfortable with doing. It's the same thing in real life, right? Now, and people turn around and say, oh, well, you can act it. Yeah, okay. Well, you know. Also, you have a role. You have so much work behind you to back it. Yeah, it's a little different too because you could also pick and choose. And even if you do it, it's not the end of the world. Whereas mm. someone like me, who was that was gonna be the first thing we were gonna see, I was like, you can't associate no, me. No, I mean maybe later on down the road or something like that. If it's if it's really, you know, if you're if you're I don't know doing, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, a production of hair and there's that you know that nudity in it there. Yeah, yeah right? that's a, okay. That's a different story. And right? you made it to a certain level. Yeah. Then you go, okay, I can do that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, even like, it's just like, you know, even when you're doing love scenes and stuff like that. You know, oh, hey, hey, that's a lot of fun. No, it's That must like, be awkward it's, as fuck. Wor- well, yeah, because, you know, don't forget, you're kissing somebody. There's you don't 50 know, people there. And there's 50 people watching. And the camera's like right there, you know. You just, you, you know, you do it and you get through it and... You know, that's a, I'm older now, so I don't have to do the love. I, I, There's I boners because I love acting. I'm passionate that, about my know. craft. <laughs> you know, so I just realized I'm very bad with boundaries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You for real or are you just saying that for um, for real? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one wants to act with them anymore. I don't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> did did Broadway kidding. did Broadway ever interest you? Broadway? No. And I'll tell you why. I want to hear that. Okay. Yeah. I like being able to, if I make a mistake, I say, I'll take that, I'll take that shot again. I'll take that scene. Okay, I'll do that. Take it again. On Broadway, you're live, right? And uh, yeah, it scares the hell out of me, right? Yeah, have you ever done any theater? Nope. Interesting. Now, I've done a little bit, like, you know, but again, I mean, I, and again, I love, I, I wouldn't mind doing theater probably. I, I wouldn't mind even doing Broadway probably, but because... Um, Jane had done a movie with uh, with Gary Sinise called Snake Eyes, with uh, Brian with, uh, De Palma and uh, Nick Cage. Yeah, yeah. okay, I don't know yeah. Snake Eyes. So she, she played the redhead in it, the, and then who ends up being one of Gary Sinise's cohorts. And oh, ooh, spoiler! They alert. filmed that here. Yep, yeah, they shot okay. it. It was the last. They shot it at the uh, the Forum. Yes, yes, yes. Like yes. The old Forum before they tore it apart. So anyway, so I was running uh, Bourbon Street at the time, and uh, Gary actually used to play in a band back in Chicago. He hadn't played in 20 years. And they put together a, a, a band with some of the, uh, the people on the, uh, on the set. And Jane said, well, you know, my guy's got a, got a he's running a club. You wanna, why don't we put together a night? So uh, they, we did. It turned into an amazing evening. It was like Hollywood came to the West Island of Montreal. So we had like Brian De Palma, we had Gary up on stage. Uh, Charlie Sheen shows up, that was fun. Uh, great when he, guy. When he showed up, was he already uh, in no, party mode? <laughs> no, he was good, but he went into party mode. There we go. Right. So, and I mean, like you know, a glass of vodka for him was like that size of that Tim Hortons glass, oh right? And God, he would yeah. drink it like that. Uh, and that's, that was just the preliminaries. Oh yeah, yeah. But he was he was a fun guy, nice guy, uh, until he, you know until he had too much. But that's you know that's like everybody. That's else, I was right? about to say yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, but Gary liked it so much and had so much fun that he um, came back and did it again at the club. And then later on afterwards, he started the Lieutenant Dan Band, uh, which goes out to all of the the veterans associations and stuff like that and raises funds for them. And uh, it was because of Jane getting him to do the first night back. And so we're kind of responsible for that. So 
we go to New York and we're, we're going to Broadway. We're going to see uh, death of a salesman with, with Gary Sinise in it. And cause he's, he's, he's another one of those talents that you just, you just go, I want to, I want to be, I want to be 20% of a good as, as good as he is. I'll be happy, you know? Yeah. So, uh, there's a, uh, an usher coming by and I said, excuse me. I said, can you do, can you get a message to, uh, Mr. Sinise? And he says, uh, he looks at me like, oh, you know, I said, just tell him that Jane and Larry are in the crowd uh, from Montreal and, and to break a leg. So, you know, yeah, okay. He walks off. So I don't think anything you know, about 10 minutes later, he comes back and he goes, uh, uh Mr. Day. I went, yes. Uh -huh. He goes, uh, Mr. Sinise would like to see you after the show. So could you sit here? And then when the show's over, so we watch the show and he knocks it out of the park. He's amazing in it. And so then we wait, everybody leaves, the theater's empty. And he brings us, we have to follow him. But we had to follow him and we had to walk across the stage. And, and both Jane and I looked at each other, and we, we had to do it. We stopped and you in the middle up. of the stage. And just, and I went, yeah, I could see why they like this a lot. This is really cool. And then we went and saw Gary and, and uh, yeah, he was, you know, he's a great guy. And uh, he didn't have to do that. No, no, it was you just a good dude move. Yeah, but he said, no, he says, it wasn't for you. I wouldn't be doing the uh, Lieutenant Dan stuff. And uh, so, you know, yeah, yeah, so, you know, I mean, you got to, like you were saying about Kristen, people are human, yeah. right? And when they, they're put on that limelight, which you cannot understand, you don't have a life anymore. It just goes out the window. And I mean, you, you, you know, yes, you're making millions of dollars. You, Getting well paid for it. But. Can't enjoy them the way you would if you no, were a private I mean, citizen. You know, like I said, I mean, like, I like going to the grocery store, right? I like, I like go, going out. I like doing what we do. I, I know, you know, that's why we started Strangers in the Night, which is the charity event that I do every year. Which is, uh, I like to be able to live, and a lot of them can't because of, of everything that happens with, with fans. But it's the paparazzi that's just. Uh, yeah, yeah like I cool. said in 2013, I learned that when I heard how they were like they were saying like they were mad at like dude don't be a bitch turn around. Yeah. Like, I didn't know that's how they spoke. I thought it was gonna be more like hey can I get a photo? Yeah, I didn't no, realize that they'll call be, you names. It used to be, but not anymore. That's why people snap. Right. Well, that, that's why they get followed and uh, look what happened to Princess Diana. I mean, hmm. Well, I got my theories on uh, that. One. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, um, yeah, I, I just you know. But it, it's, uh, you just get used to it. Yeah, just. Uh, I could never get used to it, though. So that's why I'm like. That really level? Happy. That level's insane. No, because I'm really happy with where I am and, and what I'm doing. I'm, I'm able to work. I'm able to do the work that I do. And I, I can go home and not get bugged. I can walk down the street. That's. It's amazing. That's that's heaven. Yeah, you're it's like, you know, I respect, you know, you as a stand-up comedian. My father was that. For many, many years. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and I remember I was brought up and there was, back in those days, it would have been people, nobody would remember anymore, but like uh, getting up in front of even 20 people and they're sitting there going, okay, sucker, make me laugh. That's the hardest job of the world. <laughs> Not acting, okay? What you do, is, and I've, you know what I mean? I've seen some of the major, major masters of com of comedy. Uh, my favorite would have been uh, George Carlin. That's a very good picture. Um, to me, the epitome, and I was lucky enough to see him live. Very lucky. And uh, he just was incredible. And I, I met him backstage after. His, his autograph, by the way, was not a signature. It was a smiley face. When you met him, how was he? Good dude. Hey, oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, he was, uh, yeah, he came out and spent time with everybody and talked to us. I mean, I was like a kid back then, right? Yeah, like, uh, but my parents started show business back in the days when, I mean, it was, it was huge. I mean, every star came to Montreal to perform. I mean, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, you, you name it, Louis Armstrong, all the, ma the major bands. My parents were dancing at a place called the Dance Land back in uh, 1948. The uh, Tommy Dorsey band is playing. Tommy Dorsey sees my parents dancing and brings them backstage and he says, how'd you like to be the featured dance act for the band? And that's how they got into show business. What a, then, what a different time oh, you, in you have Montreal no history. Idea. Was such oh, a you know, I mean, I, I, I can remember this city, uh, you know, working in the Olympics. I mean, it was a, you know, it was a three week party with a 30 year hangover, but oh, what a party it was. Uh, you know, um, 
even up, you know, through the rest of it. I mean, I just, I go downtown today and I, I, I you know, it's just depressing. Sad, yeah, to see what happens. It's, uh, and, the, you know, the, the, the model of what a club was didn't change for 70, 80 years. I mean, the clubs in Montreal started in the 20s because of Prohibition. And then just never stopped. And it got to the, the 40s and the 50s. It was all vaudeville. It was, and then it was shows and it was cabarets. And, and then and then the 60s, it was more uh, a changeover to disco techs, as they called them back then, because it was records and not bands that were playing. And then I, you know, in the 70s, it was us DJing. Um, I remember my dad saying, you know, you, they could work 50 weeks a year one week gigs in each place and not hit the same place twice. That's how many clubs there were in the city at the time. It was during the, it was the first referendum that really started changing the city, uh, right? 76 when the PQ got elected. People started to leave? Yeah, that was, uh, that was the, that was the main thing. Everybody got scared. Then That's the, what then started the, to create yeah. Toronto. Toronto well, would well, not well, have no, been Toronto as big was, of a Toronto city. Toronto was a bean town. Montreal, I mean, it's sad when you look at, you take a look at a picture of the skyline of Toronto in 1970, the skyline of Montreal, and the skyline today of both cities, that skyline in Toronto should have been Montreal. Yeah, you know, but I know that people cut off their nose to spite their face, uh, and it's going. It's happening today again. I mean, I thought I was, you know, forty years I've gone through this, right? Uh, Fifty years actually now, of of everything from the beginning. I remember the bombings. I remember the cross kidnapping and uh, the FLQ and everything else. And, and oh yeah, you were around during. Oh that. God, yeah. Was that a was that a scary time or yeah, it, sure it was. really yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, because I mean, you know, there was bombings in the in the '60s, and some people were killed. But when they started to kidnap people, uh, it was it was a heavy time. And then uh, it just uh, it, like this, people just started businesses start to leave. Here's the thing, right? And especially today, I mean, I went through that all this, and, we, and it, it got to there was an equilibrium uh, where anglophones and francophones. There's not a problem with this. No. Nobody had a problem with that. But because of certain political parties and because of certain people with political aspirations, they had to create problems so that they could pretend there's a problem and say that they've got to come in like Superman and save the French language. French language is not dying because you've got students from other parts of the country and, and other countries coming here to go to school. It, I mean, it's, it's just lego. Is basically he's a linguistic racist. He hates oh, right now English. you mean? Yes, I'm talking about right now. I, Back, I've thought about. I don't know? know if he hates. I think it's. Oh, he, you he know despised, what I think it is? He's even said it. Oh, okay, if he does, because what I would think is, I think it's political. I've said this to a lot of people. I feel like it's political in order to get voted in. It's what you said. You need an enemy. Yep. He's like, who am I going to find? I got this. Because in reality, speaking both languages is not a handicap. If no, anything, it's, it's, it's a superpower. It's exactly. But they don't want that because they want to keep everybody. It's like the Catholic Church in the 40s wanted to keep everybody French Canadian barefoot and pregnant. That's what they were doing, huh? Right. They didn't want them because they wanted to keep them here. It's like, as like uh, pa Parizo said, lobsters in a pot. Right. Then you've got the Anglophones at the time. And there was, seriously, a major discrepancy. And I, you know, the Francophones had a right to, to say what they did because it, it, it but then it, the balance came about all of a sudden I mean before Legault was here the French Canadians Quebecois they don't have a problem there was no problems going on and then all of a sudden it's manufactured and he's going to play to the base it's not the 514 that is going to get, uh, get, get the election. elected yeah. it's going to be the 450 it's going to be outlying areas and he panders to the fears of everything and it's scary but it works and it's still it's like what Trump did now, you know, what's happened? Your economy's terrible. Montreal, which should have been a powerhouse of a city. So it was supposed to be one of North America's. It, it yeah. was the envy. It was the yeah. greatest city. So, yeah, I love New York, but it, this was the greatest city in the world back then. Now, I mean, I, you go downtown at uh, Saturday night up. and there's nothing going on. You know, I mean, we used to come out of the clubs at 3 o'clock. I mean, the clubs would stay open till 6 in some areas, like the Limelight and the Rendezvous and stuff like that. There were traffic jams on, you know, Ready Levesque, St. Catherine, De Maisonneuve, and Sherbrooke. People were able to make money back okay, then. You the, couldn't, the city had money. That's at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know, and everybody came out of the clubs. they go to the restaurants. I mean, the restaurants were all open, you know, 24 hours. 
a lot of them because they, they had the crowd after, you know, we, we used to finish work and we go have breakfast or we go eat something at uh, like Bill Marie or these other restaurants downtown that were open. It's just sad, you know, and I, I really feel uh, a little depressed about the fact that the kids today won't experience what it was like. And they don't even have the same opportunities because the biggest thing I hear is that right now everyone's broke. But at that time, the, if you wanted to work in Montreal, there was opportunity for oh, whatever. Yeah. Everyone was making money. Yep. The city was booming. Yep. It yep. was happy. Yep. And then now, you know, I mean, the only reason Toronto has a nightlife at all is because there's 250,000 ex-Montreal is living up there. That's what I was about to say. It's <laughs> just because of Montreal <laughs> you know, that Toronto exists like, the uh, way it does now. But, um, you know, it, it's, I, I, I just, it, it, it's, it's not going to be easy for the kids today. And again, with everything that's going on, um, it's a dangerous world out there. You know, when you, when, when, you know, most of your younger generation is not getting news from a news center, they're getting news from TikTok mm. and they're believing it. That's a problem because TikTok's run by China. So China decides, you know, the, and the, and the, the propaganda going out, um, it, there's nobody there's nobody coming together anymore and compromising it's us that, versus yeah, them it's left versus right and they're so far left it's so far right no it's there's no compromise and if you don't have compromise and you're headed toward i mean i think the united states is going to go into a civil war one day they've been saying that for a while i hope not i love the u.s i, yeah. lo I love the states but they're so polar, but it's not just them. It feels, it's kind of like what you said about China. It feels like it's a psyop from other countries, oh, maybe yeah. even China. Yep. Because the polarization, it, it started in the universities, went so far yep. the last couple of years that it seems manufactured. Like it's, someone was behind it. it. It's too much. A lot of it is manufactured. And a lot of it is coming from China. And a lot of it is Which is a smart from, move on their part. a lot of it is coming from Russia as well. Yeah. And, smart move though. Know, strategically? Like, strategically, I, I, they're not stupid. You know, they know what they're doing. You know, and if we don't, you know, if we don't have strong leadership, uh, which we really don't right I now. I was about to say we don't. There's uh, not one politician in North America that you can look at and you're like, there we go. No, I mean, that's, and that's, <laughs> that's the sad part is that, you know, titans of business and everything else are, are you know, politics is like frowned upon where it wasn't before. Yeah. You know, and I mean... Was everybody perfect back in the day? No. I mean, do you think J John F. Kennedy would be able to get elected if, if he was here today with the way he was? No, because the times, banging hotties. <laughs> times are different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but, you know, to me, you know, and, I, and I've worked in a couple of movies that, that were, like, based on, you know, they're, like, end of the world type of things and things like that. Or Arrival, for instance, which is aliens coming down. I mean, yeah. If you don't think there's something else out there, we're the only thing in the world and the universe, yeah, think again. How much of, when you were on Arrival, how much of the script... Did, did, did he, did uh, like Villeneuve want to keep anything secret no. or he wanted everyone to know what's going on? No, he had beginning? everybody, we had, okay. the, we had the script in advance. So it's like. Uh, I found the concept know. interesting. I'm a big time travel guy. Yeah. So I loved mixing those things together. Yeah. And it did make me think like, oh yeah, that is, you know, we take everything for granted. Like if somebody comes here, we should be able to communicate with them. Or, right. But what but if just the method of communication. That's it. Is alien to us. Yeah. And uh, comprehending that is the key. Well, it's, it, yeah, it, it won't be like us talking together in a language or something like that. It'll probably come down to something to do with math, mathematics, which is, is that's universal. That's universal, right? yeah. Um, that's such a good idea. Yeah, but um, I, it's like Plan B, the, the TV show I've just wrapped up on. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done in French. They did really well with it. And I love the concept is that somehow there's this company that if you pay them enough money, you can go back in time. And for a good reason, they will send you back and you have a chance to write something. So this, in this series, uh, it's the, the one who is able to go back is a police officer. I'm the, I, her sergeant. And she keeps going back into time. But the problem is, is every time she goes back and fixes something. Fucks something else up. It fucks something else up. And she goes back again and she tries to do that. And it's, yeah, and it's what happens. And, you know. I'll tell you about something after the show. I have a time travel script that I wrote. I wanted to do with my uh, buddy. He's he's um, my buddy Rob. He's on a Netflix show. Uh, uh, fuck, what's it called, bro? Why am I forgetting? Uh, Umbrella Academy. Umbrella Academy. Okay. And I had I'll, I'll, I'll show you. You're gonna laugh since you like time travel. Yeah, and you, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask the parameters of this show. Um, so every time she goes back, it fucks something else up, yeah, right? Yeah. What? 
do they allow you, like, let's say if you would say, did somebody in the show would, would say, I'm going to go back and kill Hitler, for example. Right. Would they allow that? Don't Cause, know. Because you know why I'm questioning? Because what if it would stop you from creating the technology? Because the company that does it, we don't know who they are, by the way. I like this. They take the money off your credit card, but they charge you X amount per day you go back. Interesting. So if you have to go back like years, that's going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> you so you better be. Able, but do they bring you back, or you have to bring yourself back? Oh no, they bring you back. Okay, so if you can't afford it, no, they, they if you, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they actually come to the door, two of these, two of these guys, and carry you away in a truck and take you away. And the next thing you know, you're waking up and you're back. Where what you a are. fun concept! Cause I'm a big time. I love yeah. time travel. Well, it was funny because when we're shooting the show, and, and like we have to re, you know, we have to do the, what they call the Plan Bs, right? So we shoot shoot one, and then what happens, and then the same scene, but it's a little bit different, right? Because uh, something else has happened, so it's it's like the same scene, but not. And then it's for you know, it gets, it's it gets confusing sometimes because okay, which one is it? Are we doing the this one or is it this one? And you know, so the scripts are almost the same, and for an actor, that's kind of hard because when you're memorizing yeah, stuff, yeah, what's the difference? There's subtle, you know, a subtle difference and stuff like that. So, but yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so, so is yeah. there something you prefer? Like, I, I like that you're into the time travel, but are there scripts that you'll get and you're like, God, I'm all right. Oh, yeah. This is the I concept mean, I want. Uh, yeah, there's parts you'll say, okay, if I get it, I get it, and that's okay, that's cool. But there's some where you go, you call your agent up, go, okay, look, I'll, I'll work for free on this one. All right, <laughs> just get me this role. Because uh, it's it's you what's know. your what's your type that you'll go crazy for? What's what's the type of movie you want to do, or is it just working with a specific person? Uh, okay, well, um, give you an example. Um, I did a movie once. Uh, my, Susan called me up and she says, "Well, it's an actor role, which is a five lines or less role. It's it's they're not big roles, right? And I usually don't do those." I go, well, I don't know. She goes, well, it's five days, and I went, "Okay, well, no." I said, "Who's the director?" She goes, uh, "Bob Rafelson." I went. The Bob Rafelson, like five easy, five easy pieces, Bob Rafelson with Jack Nicholson, that Bob Rafelson. And she goes, yeah. The very same. I said, are you out of your mind? Of course I'm going to do it, right? Why are you asking me? Just so, <laughs> it's with Samuel Jackson. It's with Nina, Mila Jehovic. Uh, oh, shit. Okay. Oh, no. It's, yeah. So, but uh, again, here's a perfect example of, of you know, I got on set and uh, you could cut the tension with a knife. It was just, just. I wasn't good. Yeah, Sam was Sam was acting up, and he's great with great actor. Love him to death, but him and the director weren't seeing eye to eye, right? Really. So um, we're doing. I, I, now I'm done. This is day five of the five days that I'm doing, and I, I, I'm just there lapping it in. I mean, the guy's a legend, Rafelson, right? And I'm working with Sam Jackson, right? and so you know, I mean, it's it's not work. You know what I mean? So. And I don't have a lot of work because I only have five lines, right? So there's like, I don't have to memorize a lot of stuff, right? So it's great. And then last day, I don't have any dialogue or anything like that. And I'm done to the word, right? Because if you have five lines, you're an actor. You get paid X amount of money. Yeah. If you're over five lines, you can become a principal. You're paid a lot more money. So I'm like, to the word, five lines. And uh, so we, we last seen... Um, Jackson's got to say this whole, pretty well, full page monologue. And at the end of it, arrest her. And I walk off and I'm going to arrest Mila Jehovic. So we, we're blocking it, which is rehearsing it, right? And action. Just, just stands there. Arrest her. I went, what? <laughs> arrest her. I go off, right? And I come back and I go, uh, Sam, are you, you going to do that, that, you know, monologue? He goes, that's what he's going to ask you. And when he does, you tell him I'm not Dashiell Hammett. Is that what he fucking okay. told you? Because Dashiell Hammett wrote the book that the movie was based on. And he's very flamboyant and you know, descriptive and everything else. And, and, and in retrospect, you know, looking at it, yeah, he's right. Because it was really a long thing that wasn't needed. But um, so he, and he goes, I'll be, in, I'll be in the, uh, the office there. And he leaves it. And Rafelson comes up to me and he goes, motherfucker's not going to say it, is he? And I went, no, he said he's not Dashiell Hammett. And he goes, oh, okay. Well, it's not. okay. the what thing that'll work. We can do that. that. I like that. We'll do that. Okay. So just do that. And I go, I can't. 
He goes, what do you mean? I said, because it'll put me in another category because he goes, what's that going to cause? I don't know. He says, you know, I could, can I swear on this? Am I allowed? Oh, of course. Okay, yeah. Okay. He said, fuck it. You really, really did me a favor by helping me out with this thing. And he said, like, I don't care. Go ahead. Just say the word. Fucking right. Payday, baby. Payday. Yeah, well, it's one word. What? Four letters. Was an extra $11,000. Let's go. That's yeah, what I'm talking man. about. I'll take that any day. Oh, that's a good story. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was fun. Uh, but again, I mean, he's passed away now. Um, you know, uh, uh, what's a, yeah, there's, there's been a few directors I've worked with that are that are gone and, and, and actors as well. And uh, I just feel lucky that I was able to work with them. And, and uh, you know, and then there's great ones that, that uh, you know, I mean, would, who would I like to work with? I haven't worked with yet. Mm. Uh, Scorsese. Oh. I, I had a chance, didn't get the part. It went to, uh, oh God, it was somebody famous, A-list from Hollywood. But, uh, you know, I didn't mind losing out. To, oh, if I lost out to him, it's okay. But at least you got a shot. But Scorsese, I would, I would like, you know, yeah, yeah. That would be a fun one. What's his story now? Is he still doing stuff? Yeah, he just finished one. Uh, another one with, uh, you know, he's got Leo in it. And, uh, and uh, uh, it's, but it's it's kind of a different thing for him. This was a, the Oklahoma movie. It's more like a Western. Yeah, the Western. I was oh, about yeah, to say. Yeah, right, okay. about, the, oil, about, about the Oklahoma yeah. oil discovery and the Indians, uh, the, the indigenous people that had the rights to the oil uh, kind of got killed about it. So He made a movie about that. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what it's about. Okay, yeah. I want to watch so that. That's, and it's what happened and what happened and how they were treated and stuff like that. So it's... Uh, Good on Scorsese. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, another one I worked with, he's probably he's still around. He's about 90 now. Sidney Sydney J. Fury, he was the one who really made uh, Michael Caine with the Icarus Files. Uh, he did Lady Sings the Blues with Diana Ross, uh, Boys of Company C, which is a really cool Vietnam movie. And I worked with him on three movies with Dolph Lundgren back in... You know, it, it's, it's, it's like, you know, movies, the, the, the shots become your, your home movies, you know, and it's like, it's like the movie that we shot in Brazil. I mean, it, we call that our, our home, our home movie trip to Brazil. You That's know? what it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah when but you're having uh, fun but too. I just to be able to do that and work together. I mean, I've been with Jane uh, 35 years now. Congrats. Yeah. Eh, it's, you know, huh? ups and downs, but you know, you, you, you just, you know, you gotta just compromise and and uh and listen i think when people stop listening to each other that's that's when you have a problem yeah and it's like you know people say to me you know well, it, well it, okay describe acting or what's the number one rule in acting according to you and um i i stole it from richard attenborough uh acting don't get caught doing it Oh, that's a, that's a good fucking oh, wow. saying. Yeah. And that to me is, uh, you know. That's such a good saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Attenborough is the inside the actor studio guy, right? Uh, no, uh, Attenborough is a really great actor. Who's the inside? What's the inside oh, the actor okay. studio guy? Um, you know what I'm talking about? It looks yeah. like the devil. He's oh, got yeah, that yeah, devil yeah, mustache. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, James Lipton. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You're right. I'm really yeah. impressed. I remembered that actually. Um, it's, it's interesting because out of all the people you see asking questions on that show, um, there was really only one that made it really, really big. And you actually see him asking a question when he was a, a nobody. Yeah, it was, uh, what's his name? The, the guy who plays the raccoon uh, for Guardians of the Galaxy. What the fuck's his name, bro? Come Poseidon? I'm a Hangover? That's right. What's his name? Why am I, why am I blanking now? I'm Because uh... you got to give him something to do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, la, 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 Bradley, Cooper. Bradley, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. That's it. Yeah, it was Bradley, oh, Bradley Cooper. I Cooper saw that. Bradley Cooper plays yeah. uh, Rocket Raccoon. You, I, you just discovered that? I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That, I remember the clip. Yeah, I remember watching that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, you know, I'll, and, and the cool thing about acting is you, you can uh, don't have to retire. True. So you, you know. evolve into a new type of role that you can do. Well, yeah. You know, and and it's uh, it's a joy. I mean, it's it really is fun. Uh, you know, do you, do you mind getting up at the five o'clock calls and, you know, working, you know, 16, 17 hour days sometimes? No. You know, I did a movie with, uh, Belushi once and, uh, it was just us, uh, for 17 hours and we're sitting there after hour 16 and it's physical. I mean, I'm, I'm I played a, a hit man and he is a cop, crooked, a crooked cop. And we have a big fight scene and this whole thing and baseball bats and stuff and. 
and we're sitting there and you're it's probably yeah it had to be 16 hours into it you know he just said you know we're the luckiest people in the world and we, i looked at him and yeah we are you know, yeah 100 so, percent. yeah so well god damn honestly larry uh thank you for this this has been uh, great my pleasure you're, it's awesome yeah. awesome awesome time um before i go are you on the social media like you like being People I don't follow, mind it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've got you know, I'm on uh, Facebook, and apparently, I'm on Instagram. Okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm going to have all the links in the description, so if people want, they could follow you there. Absolutely. That's what I was going to ask. Do you mind if people follow you and no, all that? No, not at no, all. No, you like that? Okay. Yeah, not good, at good. all. And if they have any questions or something, just you know, send anything them. you want them to watch. Ah, uh, good question. Um, if you want to have some fun, you know, there's an episode of Suits that I did with uh, with Megan. Which was really cool. She was actually really nice too. Really, yeah, what really happened nice. to her then? <laughs> I don't know. I th I have a feeling that she had a real bad smear campaign done to her by the palace uh, mafia. Oh, so you think maybe she's actually good? A good person just comes off as a yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, she, that's I mean, they've killed uh, yeah, another princess, so it's possible. Oh, yeah, think I, yeah. I, I'm not, <laughs> not going to disagree with that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, season seven, episode eleven. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, gosh. I'd say you know, wait for a Plan B that's coming out okay. in September. Uh, Welcome to Dairy is going to be fun. And I'm the, excited the about The movie with Richard Gere is called Longing. Longing. I'm going to watch uh, Longing. Yeah. I'm gonna, I can get it today, right? I can uh, get it Longing, today. I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it should be on Netflix soon. Okay. But I think because of everything, they with the strike and everything else. and Everything's delayed. Gonna, so they may delay releasing it until they can uh, go, because I know it's going to be in the film festival. I'm very interested in watching Longing. That's it's, uh, it's an interesting movie. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's Richard and uh, again, another, another yeah. amazing, amazing actor. So yeah, that's another one to watch out for. Um, I, they just aired, I just, it was on the, uh, next, the, the newest episode of, um, Weird Doc Mysteries. I die in that. I've died a few times. I've, died, time. I've died many times. There it's are many fun. ways. Let me count the ways I've died. It's, uh, I've been strangled. I've been shot. I was killed with an icicle. Um, One of my dreams is to get killed in a horror movie. Oh, yeah. well, well see, you see, the cool thing about that is, you know, uh, you if you're in a horror movie, you get killed, you can come back. Yeah, even right? better, yeah. Which happened Kill to me. Kill me twice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and don't ever do, um, don't ever do a horror movie with a numeral after it. I just say, it. You know, like I did Night of the Demons 3, right? And it's like. It was downhill since Night of the Demons 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, so I get killed at the beginning of the movie, but because, you know, it's a horror movie, I come back, you know. Great thing about it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, good or bad, uh, you put yourself out there all the time. And, and um, if you are, if you are acting and you want to be an actor, don't give up your dream, follow your dream. Just, just be ready for a lot of hard work. But, you know, something when you get in front of a camera, finally, and you start saying lines, it's a lot of fun. Well so, said. Cause we can't trust ourselves Critically ashamed and all our faith